I am Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over Synaptics with John Weil. We're going to talk today about on-device AI. John, what is on-device AI and how has that changed? On-device AI is a concept of putting generative AI-like behavior into a product to enhance the human-machine interface of that product. So if you wanted to build a better dishwasher, how could you use what is perceived as generative AI technology, but do it on an appliance at the same price and performance that you would have in a regular appliance in the past? Well, what's the advantage of doing that? Biggest advantage is removing things uh, that we like to say kind of tongue in cheek. If your appliance says Air 22, what does that mean? That's a bad experience for the end customer. They don't want to have to go to user manual or Reddit or Google to figure that out. So with on-device AI now, we can improve that human machine experience where you can actually interact with the appliance and the appliance can tell you more about what's failing uh, versus you having to call a technical support line. Let's take a closer look. Sure. John, what are we looking at? So what we're looking at is the whole AI scope, um, small IoT devices. Uh, today, you can buy microcontrollers or some microprocessors that are in the tens of gops. Uh, you can buy processors and some super micros that are in hundreds of gops. You can buy processors in the mobile space and in the embedded space in the tens of tops. And then, of course, as you move up into this access edge, uh, you get into the hundreds of tops and up into the cloud where you can have philosophically unlimited amount of compute. Uh, and today we're going to talk about how do we take some of those technologies that you have in the cloud and how can we pull that down into a, the right price and performance point to enable a similar experience, but on a device at the edge. So how do you do that? You really want to keep this within a fairly tight power window, right? Correct. Yeah, power is super important. Price and performance are also equally important. You can't break the bank when you're designing your embedded product. You and I as end customers don't necessarily want to pay a lot more for these features. So it still has to be done in the proper price and performance point. And you also don't want to be waiting for some response from the cloud too, right? Right. Humans can tolerate a few hundred milliseconds to a response. And when you go all the way from an embedded product, say something in your kitchen to the cloud and back, it feels unnatural. So what has to happen here? So what we have to do is push the things that need to be deterministic in real time down to the edge and leverage the cloud only for those extensive experiences where more information is required. So the big buzzword right now is Gen AI, but really the thought of putting Gen AI into a dishwasher or your washing machine is way overkill, right? Correct. Let's just use the dishwasher uh, as an example to, to talk through the problem. Gen AI today has taught everybody that we can have this very almost equitable conversation with our computing platforms, right? You can interact with it and it can give you a response, but the amount of compute for that is way more than what we would ever model for a dishwasher. But what we like about it, the consumers like, is that natural interaction. But today's technology and the research has given us the ability to bring what we like about Gen AI down to these embedded devices. So if up here you're in the hundreds of tops, um, that won't fit in a dishwasher. It's just not practical. But how do we take the concepts from that and drag it this way so we can start to fit in this sweet spot right here, right? This tens of gops to a top kind of range that can fit in the same price and performance. And in doing so, you're basically moving a lot of data still, right? So you think about a dishwasher, you don't really think about a dishwasher from a data perspective, but that's really what you're doing here. We can minimize the data. We, we, what we do today is you leverage things that they call like small language models. But when we do these small language models, the, the data minimization is it's a one-way experience. We don't we don't, we're consuming what you say. In this case, you ask the dishwasher, what kind of soap can I use in the dishwasher? That's a one-way conversation, okay? It doesn't need full generative AI to do that. What we actually do is we use a concept called sentence transformers. And we can take that language model and we can take natural speech from you and convert it to tokens. And these are basically a mathematical representation of your speech. And then we can map that to a known database of responses. 
So it dramatically reduces the amount of local storage, memory, any data need in that appliance. We're only modeling a one-way transaction. That's natural speech recognition from you to the machine. When most people think about Gen AI, the things we always hear about are hallucinations and wrong results. What do you have to deal with? I mean, is it just a matter of putting soap in here or is it running the, the cycle too long or is there something else that could be done here? Yeah, so let me let me kind of walk you through that process. So we use a, you know, when we do something like this, we talk about voice activation and detection. We then move that to this sentence or speech to text concept and then into this, uh, what we call embeddings, okay? Embeddings. This is that embeddings concept, the sentence transformer. We get this vector table of what I asked, and then that maps to a database, okay, of known answers. And so there's no hallucinations because the dishwasher only knows about the curated information in its database. If you ask it what the capital of France is, it'll just say, I'm a dishwasher. I, I don't know that, right? And that that then goes back out to a text to speech and then out to some kind of speaker, right? Or whatever the other user interface is that you want to use, right? It could be also just text on a screen. So you've really tightened up the loops of what this can do and basically said, here's the parameters you work within. Correct. I mean, you're talking full natural speech for human language being in hundreds of megabytes of information we need to put in a flash product on there. It's not small, but it's not massive. And we can do this complete turnkey communication with the product on a very low cost processor. Does that mean you're going to be able to update your dishwasher as time goes on as well? Things like uh, over the air updates? Yeah, so <laughs> if you map in OTA, right? You think about what is the first thing you'd want to OTA, it's that database. Right. So as uh, you know, pick any major appliance company, they have a tech support team, they have installers, they're going to learn about their products over time. They have the ability to push what is effectively very simple text models out to the product with basically an increase in that database. Right. You're just saying, oh, we got a lot of questions about Air 22. We should add a little more commentary to the database about what Air 22 means on said dishwasher. What does this do from a security standpoint? That's always a big issue as you start getting into uh, anything connected to the internet. Unless you're worried about this, like you want to increase the database, everything I've showed you here, no cloud connection required. So actually we can bring what people perceive as this cloud gen AI concept. We can bring it down to a fully secure, non-connected product that still gives you an exceptional human to machine interface experience. And this is the whole argument between edge and cloud too, right? Is that the more you have at the edge, the safer it is because it's not going outside of whatever uh, confines it's in. Correct, correct. The next logical permutation on this is when you add another modality. So the modality we used here was very simple, right? It was voice activation and then speaking or communicating back to the human in this case. But we could also add a vision modality. Okay, so we have some very simple examples we do with customers when they're trying to understand this, where we say, let's add a camera to the equation. So now I can say, what do you see? Okay, goes through the same voice activation, goes here, goes into the embeddings, goes down here and goes, is it a command? Was I asking a question about information or was I asking it to do something? You can then put in a command and control set and there's a second path here that goes, turn on the vision pipeline. Okay, the vision pipeline then runs whatever object detection models and then feeds that back in and you get another set of tokens describing what it sees in there and then we can make another decision. But none of that had to go back to the cloud. We keep it all running right there at the edge. This also starts changing perceptions about why these devices need to be smart too. I think when refrigerators came out, they said this is gonna be a smart refrigerator where you can order food because your eggs have gone bad. That didn't really appeal to anybody. Nobody bought into it. Right. This is a different way of looking at it. Right, because it's providing value. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, right, when we say we want a smart product, what we're really saying is we want a product that brings value into the home, right? If if that product has a feature I paid for, but I never use it because I never order food from my refrigerator, then it's not particularly smart, right? It's not doing anything that's driving value. So we like to say 
we're bringing the intelligence. And it's almost like avoiding the word smart because it's got such a negative connotation today. We're bringing intelligence down to the edge where the device now has a, a persona of what it is, what it does, and what it can do. And it interacts with you, right? So my favorite customer in talking about this over the last few months was actually a camera customer. Funny that we're doing a video recording today. But being able to interact with the camera and cutting down on the number of buttons and menus and things you have to do, why not just ask it to index to a particular spot in the video or mark this for later usage? So those are things you can do with multiple modalities on it. Does it also have the capability to say, oh, your water pressure is going down, there must be a leak somewhere or some sort of problem? Yeah, so that's the, so today, right, we're saying voice is the input stimulus. But in this block diagram, uh, there's nothing that stops you from bringing other sensory inputs in. So if you have a water detection circuit or you have a humidity circuit or you have some other physical modality you want to bring in, it's very, very trivial to put it into this same kind of flow, tokenize that, that response, and then have a knowledge base that says, well, more than 100% humidity or more than some temperature or something is bad. Or your part is about to wear out. Here's another. Uh, yeah. So predictive to... maintenance, you know, traditional ML versus AI. The ML side now is not just collecting data and trying to understand when the machine might fail. You now collect that data and the machine can now interact with you that says, you know, instead of error 22, the machine just says, hey, I stopped the cycle last night at 1158 p.m. The reason your dishes are dirty this morning is because the filter is full. Right. It's a very different experience. Where else do you see this applied beyond white good appliances? The other one we're seeing, I said, uh, uh, is the general market is home consumer electronics. We're seeing a lot of asks where those types of customers are trying to figure out how to add something intelligent and, and avoid this IoT smart nature that generated less buzz over the years, didn't really materialize. So we're seeing uh, cameras, as I mentioned, home appliances, um, security cameras. Uh, we're starting to see some stuff where I want to be able to interact with the security camera, computer peripherals, you know, whether it's your printer, your router, something that is in your home that, you know, may have an experience that you can make better. So toners out, you know, it, you can actually ask it about the toner, order it, how many pages do I have left, whatever it is. Um, what we're seeing this biggest use case for this is reducing menus and buttons and screens, because we as humans don't like to click through 400 menu items on a product. This also makes it easier to install some of these products too, right? When you think about a, a network router, everybody has problems installing a network router. This should be able to say, okay, plug this thing in, let's talk to it. Tell me what's wrong. Uh, whether it's a router or my other favorite one, uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. So when you install a, a thermostat or any kind of that equipment, the single biggest failure rate for smart thermostats was not being able to get those devices on the home network when they were installed. So whether it's the homeowner struggles with it or the technician that is charged with figuring out how to be a network engineer in your home, uh, they can't, they have limited tools at their disposal, right? And so when that new thermostat, when that Honeywell installer comes out there to put that product in your home, and they bolt it up and power it on, you now can interact with it because it's a network attached device. It can then look for all the access points in the home. It can tell you what the signal strength is. You don't have to have all that embedded in a bunch of thumb buttons where you're moving through menus and stuff. So yes, you nailed it. This is a very popular thing where they can just say, hey, uh, connect to John's home network. What's the signal strength in this room? Oh, wow, it's only 67. Unbolt it from the wall, walk over here, plug it back in. What's the signal strength here? 87. Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, I think we should mount it here. It will work much better, right? That experience adds value. It's intelligent now. It adds value to the manufacturer as well, right? Because yeah. they don't have as many calls that less, you get from consumers. Yep. Less customer support calls, less dissatisfaction. I always like to joke with my guys. Uh, nobody ever calls home and says, my router is amazing. Nobody ever calls the vendor and says it dropped to only one bit per minute, per time. They, they don't give you any of that. They only write bad reviews about how they weren't able to perform in this game that they played the other day. So yeah, if they can remove the chance of bad reviews, it drives tremendous value. How long have you been working on this? Synaptics has been in the 
neural processing space for as long as we can remember, right? From the, since our beginnings. Our processing element specifically with our advanced SOCs, we've been doing for more than five years doing AI at the edge. So many of our bigger customers have been working on this technology with us for many years. But a lot of the pieces that have come together here did not exist before. You had to pull them together now. It's almost like the technology has moved up to where you really want to take advantage of it, right? Yeah, the technology's moved from five or six consumer electronics companies in the world using it to now hundreds of customers are now saying, I want to put this, you know, on-device edge AI to, to my benefit. I want to start using this to drive value for my end customers. And about a year and a half ago, Synaptics realized that there's people that need this and we have this technology. So we launched our Astro product line about a year and a half ago that was focused on how do we make this easy for customers? How do we make it so that anybody can be a hero in Edge AI? John Weil, thanks for a great explanation. Appreciate the time. Thanks a lot.